Hello, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and this is another Ableton walkthrough of what I did to an OP1 track to get it from what you heard during the OP1 recording to what you heard in the final track. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the why I did things in this one as opposed to the how I did things in this one because um, I've had a request to discuss the thinking process behind making a creative decision as opposed to the uh, more the technical side of the whole thing. So in case you haven't seen it, this one is for the um, OP1 track titled Vacuity. Uh, it's based off samples from the Hollow Knight soundtrack, um, which is a fantastic Souls-like game, really beautiful soundtrack. Uh, and I was just really inspired by some of the music and sounds in it and the game itself and I thought it would be cool to make a track with it. Before we get into the studio mix of the track, I want to show you what the OP1 mix looks like because I release both the OP1 mix and the studio mix on my Patreon. So the way that the OP1 records is on a digital tape deck that has four tracks and um, you can overdub on those tracks as much as you want. I try to keep things pretty simple by recording um, mostly drums on the track four, bass on the track three, and then my synths and other sort of melodic instruments on tracks one and two. If I have a hole in a section, like during a breakdown where I don't have drums, I'll move something else to one of those empty tracks. And uh, the reason that I do it this way is because that way when I get it into Ableton, I have um, a pretty clear picture of what I need to mix and where it is, and there's not too much stuff overdubbed on other stuff so that I can uh, really drill into the individual uh, tracks and do more stuff to it. So when you mount the OP1 in disk mode, you get four AIF files that come from the tape thing, and those are the four tracks in the OP1. So when you see in my Ableton stuff that I have track one, track two, track three, track four, um, that is those tracks from the OP1. So when I'm doing the OP1 mix, I bring them in here and I add a supercharger to everything, and that's to emulate the OP1's uh, master drive control. In this case, I added a little bit of reverb and delay because I wanted to add some of the spaciousness into the track because it's very atmospheric and everything like that. I also added a D-click to the Wub baseline and aught, and a little um, uh, stereo interest thing up on the top end because um, this section right here, with these bass lines, um, the OP1's mono only, and I wanted to give those wubs a little bit more stereo interest. I did more processing in the studio mix, but I hope that clears up a little bit about like what the OP1 is recording and then what it looks like when you get it into the computer. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for the OP1 mix. Let's go into the studio mix and see uh, what's going on there. Welcome to the studio mix of the OP1 track. Um, the way that this starts out, is with a section that I recorded in the middle of the OP1 section, which sounds like this. Otherwise, the track started off with the more minor um, elements of the Crystal Peak soundtrack, which is the bit of uh, Hollow Knight music that I used for this. And the reason that I put this at the beginning, even though that wasn't how the OP1 track went, was because I felt that this was a better um, intro to the whole thing. It's melodic, it's nice, it has uh, some really cool interest into it. I really liked the way that those vocal samples worked. So we have that starting out. We have a singing channel here, which is full of the samples from uh, Marissa's song, which is one of the Hollow Knight uh, soundtrack bits, very beautiful singing. And uh, it's running through um, Supercharger, like I talked about before for saturation, everything gets that. Um, Nectar, which is a vocal processing thing, and then some uh, delay using Replica. So we start off with this chill part, and we bring in a down-tempo drum beat. And I copied the drum channels uh, into two different drum channels. This second one here that is gonna have more of the down tempo drums is getting some equalization where we're carving off a bunch of the low end. Uh, and yeah, and everything's running through drum bus because um, it gives it a nice sort of aggressive uh, pump to the whole thing. So we go into the down tempo section of this to build the beat up. We're just introducing the beat um, and then we're gonna go into the minor part of the uh, Crystal Peak music. You can hear that we've changed our drum line and we've introduced the two Crystal Peak sounds. And there's our drum thing, which is built up of normal drum hits and little sound effects from Hollow Knight. So then we have this little breakdown. And at that point, we're adding hi-hats into the main drum line. And we're adding this little drum and bass break that's been slowed down to half its tempo. And uh, the reason that that is there is because the whole idea with 
how I'm going to move through this track is I'm going to slowly introduce elements that take it to the next stage, like hint at what's coming next. So as we're building tension with things like hi-hats and extra breaks, uh, we're sort of building a stage to get into the main drum and bass break, which is going to be the meat of the song. And as you can see, we have another iteration of the breakdown here. And now we've introduced that same drum and bass break, but it's faster. So we're starting to introduce uh, the idea that we're um, adding tension rhythmically, and we might go to a faster place in a little bit. So we also add the vocal there. We're still kind of floaty, you know. And then we break down into the same drums we used at the beginning in terms of tonal quality, but now we're introducing that drum and bass break. Moving from the idea of the track being at 85 BPM into the track actually being at 170, which is his real BPM. But we're keeping the beat like chill because we don't want to just, you know, move right into the, the big drum and bass section. And um, we still have another break here to keep that, uh, that idea that we're going to be moving into real drum and bass, and we have more singing. Now here, we do a couple things. We fade, we drop the beat out and then fade it in. You can hear that this beat has extra hi-hats on it, but I didn't want it to just I didn't want it to just sit there. I wanted it to be like, okay, well, here's a little bit more interest, but we're going to fade it out using the uh, the auto filter. You can see the auto filter working over here to bring that down. So the idea is that, okay, well, here's a little bit more interest. We're building towards something, but we're also taking away. We're, we're creating tension by um, taking stuff away from the beat. Um, but we're also adding a very filtered version of the aggressive sort of like neuro wub stuff. <laughs> So again, we're hinting at what's to come. So that wub track is also sent to an instance of this really affected channel with Guitar Rig doing some really spacey stuff and Replicant doing some glitchy stuff. You can see that there's no bass here, it's just mids and highs, and then we have some um, some echo on it that's very stereo. So this guitar rig track is acting as like a, an extra space track. If I want to uh, add some interesting space uh, echoey stuff to it, then I'm gonna throw it into this track. So um, that's one of the things I really like about taking the OP1 stuff and bringing it into Ableton because while the raw process of creation in the OP1 is really direct and uh, fulfilling, um, the ability to just really get into sound design and make things more interesting is what Ableton does best. We are filtering down the vocal, we're filtering down the beat, we're adding uh, the instance of the filtered wubs to sort of like imply that we're about to get into something more hairy. And then we're going to have a little bit of breakdown and then have the vocal ring out a little bit before we get into the beat. So you can hear there, we've introduced um, a more frenetic drum line. But we're still fil filtering it down. We want to sort of like punch in the tension and then move back from it, which actually creates its own tension. The vocal line is uh, going to introduce um, a little bit more movement and then it's gonna fade out on that sort of single note, which removes the tension from the vocal line and lets it sort of go back into the big, uh, go back into the background. And then finally, we have this little riser um, that I introduced in the OP-1 that's intention is to, again, signal that um, something a little bit more aggressive is gonna happen. And you can hear that the auto pan here is being modulated to increase the tension again by increasing the rate of the auto pan. So just a little trick to increase the tension of a riser. And then we get into the stripped down version of the main beat and we introduce the bass. But we're doing so in a very stripped back way because again, we don't want to bludgeon the listener with too much stuff at once. I don't really like to change just one thing when I'm moving between phrases, but I also don't want to change too many things. I want to give the listener always something to remember the previous section by, but also keep their ear intrigued by moving on to something that's different. So let's go into the main beat. All right, 
So uh, this section of the drum here goes from very stripped back to adding more stuff in between it. So that's increasing the complexity of the drum line, which is increasing the complexity of the listener's experience. You can also hear that we have this little uh, same affected guitar channel thing, adding just some cool atmospherics in the background because I like to, you know, keep the ears tickled by things. Um, we haven't changed what's going on with the basis of the Crystal Peak music. It's still sort of holding down the foundation of uh, the whole listener experience. So now we're letting the listener experience the new drum break. And now we're going to enter a different beat in the background. So we changed the experience here. And we also introduced this little uh, peak rise, a little pitch rise in the, um, the main Crystal Peak music. Again, just be like, oh, well, we're still listening to the same thing, but it's not staying completely static. And just also signals that something else has changed and you, the listener is going to hear that other drum and bass back, uh, break in the background and hopefully like still be engaged but not like bowled over with change. All right, so then we get into the uh, first instance of the big neuro sort of wub things. And you can hear that we have a big riser that is leading up to this whole section, and uh, then another riser, and then another riser. So we're really trying to get the listener to understand that we're moving towards something different here. In this section, we have these big sort of like wubby bass lines. Let's go ahead and solo those and take a listen, and we'll talk about what's going on there. Alrighty, so um, there was some nasty clicking, so I'm using this RxD click to uh, take away the clicks, um, which unfortunately adds a lot of latency into my signal, but uh, it was necessary. We're using uh, everyone's friend Ott, which is a um, specific multiband compressor setting, which sort of smile curves the whole thing. And then we're still using um, the uh, audio effects chain here to add um, a phaser and stereo imaging to only the high end, and then here's our dry signal. It's going into Neutron for some EQ and compression, and then we're uh, using a bit of overdrive just in the mids to bring back some of the grit that uh, the EQing and stuff like that got rid of. These were played as one shots in the OP-1. I made a kit of these things and just sort of mashed on them, which was actually pretty effective. We're also uh, introducing this little filtered version of the um, Crystal Peak music. So it was filtered in the OP-1, but then I ran it through some more stuff in Ableton. And this is to, again, even though we're changing the baseline considerably, um, I wanted something there to remind the listener that like we're still in the same space in terms of melody. So this is running through a uh, combinant, which is a multiband distortion unit, just destroying it. And then we're using a diffuser to push it into the background. Finally, we have this little voice, uh, which is a character voice from Hollow Knight. And again here. And the reason that exists is because um, I just wanted to use it. And I thought it was fun. A lot of jungle drum and bass stuff has like uh, dubbed out uh, little vocal samples in it. So since I didn't have any like Jamaican Rasta fucking toasting stuff, this was uh, my, my compromise. So we're going to let that play out a bit and then we're going to go into another section. So I'll start it here and we'll hear what happens. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's talk about right before we get into this. So we've dropped out the beat and only left the top break beats because again, at the end of a phrase, creating some sort of notice to the listener that like, hey, we're at the end of the phrase, let's go ahead and like change it up a little bit. Like a lot of the times when I'm making this kind of music, I, I think about like, how can I, how could I dance to this? And like giving someone that's dancing like a little bit of uh, change to move around to is sort of how I still think about a lot of uh, electronic music production. So we got a bunch of risers and here's a little fall. 
when I make big changes, when I go into big other sections, I like to use bigger risers and falls um, because that sort of helps denote that like uh, this is a bigger event. Um, so you can hear that we have the vocals back. So we're returning to the vocals. We've dropped out our Crystal Peak music completely because instead we have this arp. This is pretty processed. Um, we're using Replicant to glitch it out. And we're using uh, the echo and taking out the uh, low end. I actually really love the way this sounds. Uh, everything is going to these two um, sends, by the way. We have a hollow room um, doing reverb and we have Replica doing some interesting uh, delay stuff. It's not a traditional delay. Where's my thing? It's diffused and kind of swimmy, which is neat. We also go back to the more deep throb bass as opposed to the big wub bass. On here. Okay, well, you can hear that we introduced um, that sort of squidgy acid line um, before uh, I had a pretty aggressive um, instance of like DNA synth, which is a really nartsy OP1 synth that I did stuff with here, but I really just liked that um, that acid line instead. So um, because I can't leave everything anything alone, I'm running this through Replicant 2 and it's doing some really cool glitch stuff. <laughs> That's what it sounded like before. Pretty cool, but listen. I love that. So why? Well, uh, because we've just moved into sort of like Venetian snares territory. I mean, I'm not obviously as good as Venetian snares, but or square or early square push or something like that. And um, I really, when I when I hear a sound and I think of a genre that it belongs in, I want to make it more like that genre. I want it to sort of like embody the feeling of um, the genre that I'm trying to pull from. And so adding that glitchiness to that really helped sort of like cement it as a more interesting sound and also like cement it in more in the genre that I was going for in this particular section. Um, we have the ARP. And we've moved into just a strictly minor sort of thing almost. Um, where we had the beautiful singing before, this is sort of a mix between the darkness of the wub section and the, the beauty of the other section. We've got a guitar rig instance here that's running uh, that acid line through it, but it's just completely fuzzed out, and that gives us some interesting uh, stuff to listen to in the second section. And then we have this longer instance of the riser, which is just screaming as it comes in. I just fucking love. Um, we actually drop out the auxiliary drum and bass break here and just leave our main drum line. And we have a very deep bass going on. Oh, it's not actually that deep. It's a cross between the deep and not. This actually should have been in the uh, deep section, but um, again, this whole section is sort of a cross between it. It's more aggressive than the singing section, but it's not as aggressive as the as the main web section. So, um, you know, having this over here would have sounded like this, and it's just not enough. I, it needs to be more aggressive. In the second section that the bass web uh, exists in, I did a little bit of transposition automation because uh, this reminded me of Square Pusher. And again, if you're repeating something for 16 bars or whatever, like you want to have enough stuff changing where the audience feels engaged. Like I like to make stuff that has a lot of repetition, but I also want to make sure that it's changing enough in small ways where it, it feels organic. Like someone touched this, someone actually cared about what was going on here as, as opposed to just having something be uh, a repetitive like beat. So uh, let's see what else. Again, big riser. You can tell we're going into a new section by, uh, based on the, the rise here. We also have that big aggressive riser here. So let's hear what we're going into.
Okay, so this is where I discovered that um, if you turn on the arpeggiator uh, in the OP-1 and play with the sample start time, you get some really cool gated uh, effects with, um, with the sample. And so the vocal is that. Very fun. Uh, we've gone back to the deep bass because uh, we're giving, it seems like mostly I use the deep bass when I have the vocal in because it gives space for the vocal. So that's cool. Um, we have reintroduced Crystal Peak, but it's chopped up. And uh, we uh, switch between two drum and bass breaks down here because, um, you know, we're adding uh, some motion. And this, this one here, this first one is uh, very ride heavy, which rides always give uh, tension in the high end, which is nice if that's what you want. But I liked the fact that like I could introduce this uh, fall right here and then introduce this break, which is a lot cleaner and completely change the feel of it. cleans right up, which is really cool. So we're building, and then we're gonna go into this. So you recognize this section from the beginning. Um, I recorded this section in, in the near the tail end of the OP-1 session, but I liked it so much that I wanted to have it twice. <laughs> it happens a lot with the OP-1 thing. I'll, I'll find something halfway through my session that I'm like, oh wow, I could have just used that as the theme for the whole thing. So we are chilling out on the Crystal Peak stuff. It's very uh, chill. It's just pretty static. And it's uh, accentuating one note that goes with the uh, the vocals. This whole thing is meant to be like a very, very, uh, it's like a respite uh, after everything that we've gone through before we get to the final push, um, which means that uh, everything is just sort of like sitting there and it's not doing too much. It's uh, giving the listener a chance to breathe. We've also gone back to 85 BPM and our drums aren't that crazy. So we get through this section uh, where we introduce the whole thing, where we introduce this theme. And um, there's some risers going on in here. And then we get into the section that um, now that we've introduced the theme, we can build on it. So obviously it's the same thing going on, but we've added a lot more sounds to listen to. So uh, in the OP-1 section, the thing that I added to this was the hi-hat in the drums and um, these pads. And the original pad sounds something like this. But I was like, that's not really hitting enough for me. So I added erosion to one instance of the pad. And then the second instance is getting um, modded more. So that diffuser pushes things into the background. But then in the second instance of it, it's getting guitar rigged to give it more uh, more sort of uh, bite. So that's hanging out in the background, sort of, um, you know, giving a bed to this section. Um, and then let's see, we took the uh, Crystal Peak thing, this track two bit right here, and we duplicated it into this guitar rig section which has a bit of an auto wall going on. So it just adds a little bit of distortion to the whole thing, um, to that line. And then we're running the uh, vocal line into this combinant thing. And I really like combining sort of like chill melodic things with distortion. So distortion is just such a powerful tool. It doesn't always have to be like about aggressiveness. It can also make things warmer and more uh, more interesting. And so that's what's going on here. I'm, I'm introducing more distorted elements. I don't know. It's it's almost like shoegaze. Like I think that's the idea that I'm thinking behind it. And like like spiritualized or something like that. You know, like they they use a lot of distortion but it's not always in the pursuit of being aggressive. It's almost sort of, um, it's almost sort of just like doing drugs. I don't fucking know. It's just, it's an aesthetic choice. <laughs> All 
right, so in this section, we're doing the same thing that we did before uh, going into our main beat. We are introducing that uh, sort of tense, um, sped up drum line. We're filtering that in, same thing from before. We're using risers. Using the auto pan on the riser to increase the tension. And then up here, we're using the same riser through guitar rig. So we're really trying to signal to the listener that we are moving into a more aggressive section. All right, so this is a very stripped back section, but it sounds very big because of what's going on. So we have our drum line. This is the full version of the drums, hi-hats and everything. We have our big ass wubs. And we have our little we have our little ghost friend up here doing a little sci-fi melody thing. So we're just gonna let that play out. And then after it's done, repeated that twice, we're gonna add more stuff to it um, to be like, hey, we still wanna keep this groove going, but we're just gonna add uh, some more distortion. We're gonna add the acid line up here. We're gonna add some um, stuff with uh, arps. So let's take a listen to what happens there. So, that acid line's back. The ARP is back. Oh wait, I doubled the uh, acid line into here. So, Replicant up here is doing the um, sort of like dry glitch, and then down here we're getting that reverbed echo. This. Wow, I just went to town on that. So we have three instances of that squidge line just uh, all processed differently. Um, and then the wubs are doing the same thing. And then here, we're gonna drop out the beat completely, and this is gonna go back into the, the final capitulation of the whole thing. So we're gonna drop the beat out, we're going to let those wubs just sort of like smash you over the head, and then we're gonna bring the vocal back in, we're gonna drop the beat into the um, uh, stripped down intro version of the drum and bass break, and we're gonna finally introduce the drum and bass break one last time to sort of like clear the air with the singing and then use the singing and the nice pretty stuff to capitulate the track into a single note with a little bit of bass. What's happening here? So you can see the drum and bass break is not where it belongs. Um, after we after we let the beat come back and then drop out again, um, I wanted to have more rhythmic interest. I constantly want to like shuttle people through the experience of um, of each section and each sound sort of having a life of itself and being able to represent that sound in different ways during different sections. So I took that beat, I ran it into one of the replicant tracks, and. Uh, we still get the uh, rhythmic interest of it, but uh, we're filtering it down and we're sort of saying goodbye to this sound. Um, the singing is happening here. It's actually um, been warped to be double the, the length because a longer phrase is uh, sort of chiller in general to listen to. So as we're saying goodbye with the break here, I wanted to add a little bit of the vocal into this replicant track as sort of like a rhythmic interest thing, like, it gives it a different character. It gives it a different, like, like sort of soul, and um, it just sort of like adds a different tonal interest while we're we're sort of fading out here.
right before we hit the end, we use this little riser. This is the same riser as over here, but you can see it's been turned down a ton. And that's because I don't need to bowl anyone over the head with this final final uh, transition. It's We're already very, very low down into the mix. We're already very chill. And so just enough to nudge into that last bit, just to get a little bit of energy. We have this kick drum here, which I just thought was a nice impact to the, to the very end. And then we have the tails of the of the various reverb and delay that sort of just allow us to fade out in a nice way. Um, and that's it. Uh, that is Vacuity, AKA the Hollow Knight song, the first Hollow Knight song. There may be more. There's a lot of cool samples in there. Um, I didn't want to call this one Hollow Knight because I may, <laughs> I may revisit samples from this to make more tracks. So yeah, thanks for sticking around. I hope this was interesting. I actually really liked talking about it this way over just going through track by track and saying, here's what I put on here. I think this may be more useful to people in general when talking about like what I did in a session and why. If you like this, uh, let me know in the comments. Um, if you uh, didn't like it, I guess let me know there too. I don't think I can stop you. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, check out the links in the description for uh, links to the original OP1 video. If you want the tracks, they're on Patreon. I will release them later in the year as part of an EP or an album um, like I normally do. And uh, yeah, my name's Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.